Welcome back, everybody. You've joined the Steel City Blitz Steelers podcast, brought to you by Deck Roofing of South Florida. For all your commercial, multifamily, or mixed-use needs, contact the good folks at Deck Roofing in South Florida. They'll take care of you. Steel Dad is taking the night off. He is uh, visiting the fine folks down there in Deck Roofing, and actually was the last few days, and currently is on a plane. This is Ben. I'm joined by... Ian, who is usually on the podcast with me, and Ellie has joined us again tonight. How's everybody doing? Not bad. How are you? I'm good. I've got whiskey. I'm happy. <laughs> Ian? I'm good. I have uh, Yingling Black and Tan tonight. Ellie, yeah. what are you drinking? <laughs> oh, can I just lie and say I am drinking something? <laughs> You're not drinking. I'm not drinking. No, I'm not. Wow. I'm terrible. I know I'm terrible. Let That's... the team down. You really, yeah, you're not even trying. Wow. <laughs> Ian, how's oh, Maggie? Maggie is great. Maggie's asleep right now on my lap, so she'll probably wake up and participate in the call at some point in time as well. Yeah, she usually does. All right, then. That's a Guinness. So it's been uh, it's been an eventful week <laughs> for the Steelers. Uh, you just miss Schuster's back. Resigned the day after we recorded the last podcast, Friday. Um, the Steelers used the voidable years mechanism again for the third time this season, and it appears that they've used it a fourth time. We can discuss that in just a few minutes. Ian, uh, what was your take on Juju coming back? I mean, aside from probably being surprised. I was surprised. I mean, we, we said on the podcast last Thursday that it was an uh, option, but I would be surprised if it happened. Um, I'm really surprised they've continued their use of voidable years other than with Ben. I kind of thought Ben was the exception to the rule because they had never done it before. Um, I'm really surprised they've done it with some other contracts, Juju included. Um, but it does help from a salary cap standpoint, and they were able to give him $8 million for one year, which they definitely would not have been able to fit that under the normal cap. So using those voidable years got it done, and he's back. And now we pretty much have a, our one through five receiving core set for next year. I mean, you've got... Claypool and Johnson on the outside. You've got Juju in the slot. You've got Ray Ray McLeod as your kick punt returner and slot backup trick play guy. And then James Washington can kind of fill in at either outside position and kind of do whatever you need him to do. So I think we're pretty much set at wide receiver. And we also signed that kid out of Georgia after his pro day too, who I'd say, you know, at worst is a practice squad player, but at best may be able to make the roster as a sixth sixth receiver um i can i can talk tonight sure um so, <laughs> so yeah this is going well um but but yeah i was i was surprised they did it all the olds were angry on twitter and i was actually surprised at how many people i kind of ran into over the last week uh like people i know in person that were like i can't believe they re-signed juju i'm like he's good he's led our team in receptions he had our the most yards after catch of anyone on the team last year he tied for the lead in touchdown and receiving touchdowns like he's a good player and he's only 24 years old and i'm of the opinion that there's no such thing as a bad one-year deal now granted with the voidable years there's some slight additional dead money on the cap in yeah, future I, years but nevertheless there's no such thing as a bad one-year deal. we're going to discuss that in detail here in a minute uh, the, the voidable years aspect of it. So I'll, I'll give you a, a chance to expand upon that. You want me to do it now or you want to get no, Ellie in no, on this? Let's do it. Let's get Ellie in on this. Ellie, yeah. yes. what was what was your, I mean, again, beyond surprise and, you know, mm -hmm. obviously you were very happy. What, what was your, what were your observations, I guess is a better way of putting it. I mean, I, I, I talked to you obviously yes. frequently, so I kind of knew that you were happy and, surprised and everything else but yes. what were your observations in seeing the reaction of people in general it was exactly what i expected um i don't think since definitely the 2020 season but i think some of the 2019 season as well there has been a very clear divide on people that like juju and people that don't and i think it's becoming almost a bit difficult to be someone who just likes him but doesn't love him and someone who is bothered by some of the things he does but doesn't hate him i think if you ever 
kind of lean in either direction people assume you're either a super fan or you're like mark madden i hate the kid so um it was exactly <laughs> what i expected to be honest <laughs> <laughs> and you know Ellie brings true. up a really good point here too, because this did bring out people's true colors. Like yes. the the bloviator of Pittsburgh Talk Radio uh basically tweeted that he can't wait for the Steelers to lose and him be proven right. Like when you reach the point where you'd rather be right than have the team see success, like you need to seriously take a look at your opinions in your life. Like we've often said on the show, Ben, I know you've said it often that like Mason Rudolph sucks, but you would love to see him prove you wrong because you want what's best for the team above all. Mm-hmm. So, of course. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, that's one of the great perspectives that I think, you know, a lot of the non-traditional media, you know, podcasts, blogs, things like that bring to the conversation is that we actually have that rational opinion of we'd rather see what's good for the team than our, we'd rather be wrong and see the team succeed than yeah. be right, even if Mason Rudolph and Zach Gentry do suck. I 100% that's exactly where I think the my issue with certain people and their reaction to him being signed lies. You would rather that this team suffered as a result of signing him because you have that much ridiculous what what kind of I don't know why you could hate someone he's not a hateable person to me you can find him annoying sure but he's not hateable he doesn't do anything that makes me hate him I think that's a really bizarre concept that people have this legitimate dislike for him which I think is really just it's founded on it's the popular answer now it's the popular response among some people and it's how far can you take it how nasty can you get and for me it's you know I'd rather see the team I'd rather see the team be successful than um, my favorite players stay, but we suck as a team. I I agree with that. Uh, you know, I, a part of it is just the the mob mentality of social media yeah. and and people piling on. But the whole thing you pointed out before about it being binary, you either have to be, you have to totally love this guy or you have to totally despise him and, you know, just can't support him at all. Yeah, that I just don't get. I mean, and there've been players the Steelers have had that I've I've been absolutely for or absolutely against because I thought they were either fantastic players or people or horrible people or players. But those are pretty few and far between. And Juju's neither one of those things. I mean, he's a good number two receiver. I don't think he's a number one. But looking back, I don't think Heinz Ward was a number one receiver, and and he's one of the greatest Steelers of all time. Mm-hmm. So I don't really get the gripe that people have with him. The guy goes out and plays his ass off and makes dumb videos. So what? Yep. Get over it. <laughs> get over 100%. it. I don't know how many times I've said it on this show. Get over it. He's a kid. He does some dumb shit. So what? I Moving agree. on. Uh, the receiver from Georgia that Ian alluded to earlier, this is a, actually a pretty great story. So I wanted to reiterate kind of what happened this last week. Um, he was signed last year by the Titans, I believe. And there wasn't much of a camp and there was no preseason. And so he ended up on a practice squad for a, a very brief period of time and then got cut and ended up on the street. And then went back to Georgia for the 2021 Pro Day and just competed with the other receivers and caught the eye of one Kevin Colbert, who walked down on the field and signed him on the spot. Mm -hmm. Pretty great story. You know, it's like his agent tweeted out, always compete. You never know who's watching. And I I tend to agree with what Ian said. I think the, the receiving core is pretty well set. This will be the first year. Yeah, I... I will say this, and then they'll do it anyway. This will be the first year that I can think of the Steelers won't draft a receiver. But who knows, man? They may still do it anyway. They love to take receivers in the draft. They just love it. Um, so, I, you know, we'll see what happens. But I, I thought that was a great story. Uh, what do we have? Voidable years. Uh, you want voidable to about. years. Yes. yes, Ian. Talk to yeah. me about voidable years. The Steelers have pushed... Uh, a total of $16.8 million into 2022 that is going to be paid out this year and will count 
next year in in total. And it's it's basically it's written in stone because those contracts void. Talk to me about that practice. Yes. So it is something that the Steelers have never done in the past, but pretty much just started doing this year primarily because of COVID um, that it was, you know, uh, Dan Rooney felt like it was a way to, to circumvent the salary cap and actually try to get the NFL to write in language to the contract, to the collective bargaining agreement that teams couldn't use voidable years, but was unsuccessful in that venture. Um, somewhat fortunately for us now, the Steelers have been able to take advantage of it um, and, and use it this year uh, because the cap went down significantly, um, almost by $20 million um, and actually probably effectively by $20 million. Because if you figure that the the minimum salary numbers are going up, so even with the same amount of cap room, you can't sign as many guys, so on and right. so forth. Um, so I'll, I'll use Juju as a good example, right? That, you know, there are minimum contract minimum salaries that players have to get for a year so juju's at the age and length of experience where his minimum salary is essentially a million dollars so he gets that for this year he received a seven million dollar signing bonus so as we have reiterated many times that uh you know all dollars you pay out to players have to count against the cap eventually whether it's in the current year or in future years. So what they did with Juju and they've done with some other players as well, Ben Roethlisberger um, and Cam Sutton. And I think Eric Ebron as well. I don't know if it was confirmed. They did it with Ebron or not. Not Um, confirmed, but I mean, basically that's, that's really the only way they could have worked it out. They could not restructure his deal. There was, there was no way to spread that bonus out over future years because there were no future years. Right. So it was either, it was either, an extension with no new money, which right. I don't think it was because they would have publicized it as an extension or a, you know, voidable year deal or a straight pay cut. And I don't think Ebron would have taken a straight pay cut. So I'm assuming it's a voidable year deal. At any rate, back to the explanation. Um, so Juju had a, I'm using him as the example, $7 million signing bonus that got prorated over the five years of the contract. Um to count 1.4 million per year over the five years. So in 2021, his salary cap number is only $2.4 million, the 1 million bonus plus the 1.4, uh, you know, prorated signing bonus. And then, um, you know, if a player is cut before the end of their contract, or in this case, if their contract voids, all of the remaining prorated bonus money counts against the year's cap in which they are either cut or the contract is voided. So since Juju's contract voids after the 2021 season, that means that years two through five are essentially fake years on the contract and just there for accounting purposes. And the remaining $5.6 million in dead money will count against the salary cap in 2022. That and that's is... essentially how it works for Ben Roethlisberger, Cam Sutton, Eric Ebron, whoever else they do it with, just with different numbers. Well, Sutton has uh, has two years, two real years, and three oh, yeah, fake years. Right. Sorry. So yes. Cam Sutton's won't count next year. Uh, mm-hmm. I should note that I I know I don't know how I did it before my my math was bad, and I looked at it again. I'm like that doesn't make any sense. While you were talking, the Steelers have pushed 19.6 million dollars into 2022, not 16.9. Um, it's a substantial amount of money, and mm-hmm. I realize they have a lot of cap room next year. But as of today, they have 23 players signed, and three of those contracts are going to void, so they don't count, which means they have 20 players signed. And remember, Uh, some of those guys were guys that were signed to just two-year deals this year, which is essentially, as we talked about last week, a one-year deal with a team option for a second year because if Zach Banner goes out and stinks, then we can cut him and save $5.5 million in cap space. So, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so the fact that they have a lot of space next year, again, while mathematically that is the case, they don't have many players signed, and they don't have players like a starting quarterback signed. They don't have T.J. Watt signed next year. Um, They don't have a left tackle. They don't have a, a starter at running back. They don't have a center. They don't have a number of players signed to 2022 and people are already counting this cap space that's a that's an illusion at this point let's not count that until we have a better idea a better grip on what they're going to need to spend next year to be competitive 
mm-hmm. and I got a feeling it's going to be a lot. Yeah. Um, um, and, and just one thing to clarify too, I referenced Zach Banner and I do hope that he is very successful this year and can lock right down one of those tackle spots because at right if tackle. he does, yes, because if he does, then 5.5 million for a tackle is quite cheap on the market. So it's yeah. potentially a very good deal for us. But if he, you know, worst case scenario is he's bad and we have to cut him, but I hope he's very good and we can keep him at that very cheap rate. So just wanted to get that yeah, out there. For sure. Absolutely. Uh, next controversial subject of the week, <laughs> because uh, basically people equated this with we, the Steelers had to do this in order to fit Juju's contract under the cap, which is not true, not the case, not even maybe. They could have afforded both. They made a decision, and Steven Nelson has been released. They gave him an opportunity to seek out a trade. That trade wasn't going to come to fruition. That became pretty clear when the Bears cut Kyle Fuller. Um, I lamented about that on Twitter, and basically I was just bitching about the fact that the Steelers didn't have any leverage. I didn't think in in – trade talks um i don't enjoy being right about that i was actually pretty disappointed as i was writing it i was like this is a a talented guy we're gonna let him go for nothing and we let him go for nothing ellie yeah how did you feel about this and what did you observe again about this whole debacle it's a shame because um i like steven nelson and um i was sad that it that that was the way it went that that we released him for nothing um and you know it's a shame and i and i and i hope that you know i hope he does find an, an, a home somewhere and i hope that he, he is able to continue his career but i don't i don't really know i i obviously don't know the exact reasons to why they didn't choose to keep him a lot of people are saying that they chose joe hayden over him um i don't know if that's true or not i don't really know exactly how that the logistics of that it was a shame I I really did take a little bit of an issue with the way he handled it on Twitter at first because it kind of him saying about he felt like he was being held hostage and then 20 minutes later he wrote this really sweet goodbye message that was like the Steelers organization is so uh top class and amazing and I'm so grateful I just thought it kind of dampened that that a little bit because of the original message he had written but he was frustrated and when you're right, frustrated right. you say things that you don't mean but yeah so the the thing that i was seeing a lot of because i don't i agree the juju thing is not real that that was proven not to be the, the case was something to do with keeping joe hayden instead of stephen nelson yeah my understanding was they reached out to both player agents yeah to discuss the possibility of an extension and after gathering some information, having some preliminary talks, they made a decision and they kept Hayden yeah. surprises me. And to be perfectly frank, I mean, we've gone on record on this show that we would have gone the other direction if we had to make that choice, but the Steelers made this one and they basically decided they were going to spend this much money in their defensive backfield And one of those outside corners had to go and they chose to keep Hayden and it is what it is. I mean, they run the team. We don't, um, Ian, you, you talked about this last week. Um, and, and you've obviously talked about Nelson and Hayden in, in previous conversations. Um, were you surprised that he was let go one and two, did you see it as, I don't know. Is necessary? Is that the right way to put it? How do you see this move? Do you see it as a good move, as a poor move, as a let's wait and see, we'll judge it later? Yeah. So based on oh, Maggie does not like losing Stephen Nelson. Apparently, <laughs> um, based on uh, my understanding that Nelson wanted an extension worth way more than what the Steelers were willing to pay, then that made it a pretty easy decision. So. Uh, I'm going to mute myself for a minute. We can uh, hop over to Ellie for her opinions. <laughs> All right. Real quick. <laughs> oh, Maggie, she does not agree with the Joe Hayden choice. <laughs> oh, it's fine. You know, Maggie's being Maggie. Uh, you know, I, the other thing that kind of jumped off at me, I didn't really have any issue 
with him tweeting what he tweeted and yep. people didn't really understand that and i got a little heat for it but the thing i want people to understand is that this is a business and mm-hmm. that hayden excuse me hayden oh, jesus nelson needed to get out on the market as quickly as possible yes. and that was why he legitimately felt like he was being held hostage and the reason he needed to get out on the market as quickly as possible is because the money is drying up and he doesn't have an opportunity to get the big contract this year. He's going to, at this point, he's probably going to have to sign a one year deal with someone and approve it kind of a basis mm-hmm. and then go back out into, into free agency next season. Um, I did take a little bit of an issue with the blessing in disguise tweet. Um, I kind of thought that was a little petty, but you know, the but, don't uh, hold me hostage. You've made your choice yeah. because the Steelers. The Steelers clearly had made their decision. They'd made a choice, and what he wanted was to be able to walk, and so they let him walk. Now, yes, you can criticize him for taking it public and not just having his agent call them and say, hey, come on, let this guy go. Yeah. You know, I get that. If if that's your beef, I understand. But, and I'm going to let you come back to me on this and and sure. and, and re- retort but it occurs to me that a lot of Steelers fans will blindly support the team and the players until they're gone and then they are fucking scumbags and it's like we learned our manners and we learned to support the people that we like from and I'm sorry to put it this way from Donald J Trump who does exactly that Mm -hmm. you don't if you if you support someone you like someone and you want to understand who they are and what they do then you support them and you make an effort to understand what it is they're trying to do you don't Mm -hmm. always agree with them you don't have to agree with them but you don't turn on them you don't have to make you don't have to turn them into villains well you were always a scumbag you were never a good player and you're complaining now and you could have just honored your contract and not demanded a trade and xyz well nelson didn't demand a trade what he what he did was probably ask for too much money yes Steelers didn't want to pay it and so they said to him hey we're gonna cut you but we're gonna give yeah. you an opportunity to go out and get a trade, we think that $8 million for your services is actually a bargain. And, uh, you know, we think the other teams will see that as a bargain as well. We're going to put you out there for trade first, let you earn that, and, you know, part as friends, Mm -hmm. so to speak. Well, the whole thing just, it was just absolutely, the way they executed it was a debacle. Um, And I, I don't, I don't fault the team for it. I don't really fault Nelson for it. You just have differing points of view on the way that should have been handled and a lot of frustration in the end. Yeah. And it, yeah, it, some things were, were said or were written for lack of a better way of putting it, that, that maybe were a little petty or maybe weren't handled exactly as well as they could have been, but those things happen. And yeah. Yeah. So please, Come back. Tell me what you think. It's fine. You know, I don't dis- I don't disagree with you at all because you you're right in the you know, fans and we're all guilty of it, when people are no longer wear the black and gold, people kind of wash their hands of them. And when they go out of a little bit of a I don't want to say you went out of the bank because you didn't. It was just a small comment, a passing comment that could be taken anyway. Um but when they go out with a little bit of like a chip on their shoulder, the fans do take offense to that because they feel, well, I probably bought your jersey, I supported you, and now I feel you're because because they're getting That's such fair. a, a two dimensional view of what's truly happening. That's um, fair. That yeah, they feel a little bit. But I supported you, and you and you're you're turning your back on me. That's how it can sometimes feel. But the truth is, is that it's a business, like you said, and. The organization has to make tough decisions and the players are entitled to feel frustrated by those tough decisions. Did I like what he said? No. Did I feel that the hostage comment was inappropriate? Yes. But at the same time, 
we've had a lot worse said about this organization from te- players that have left him saying that my suggestion to fans is do what you do best and just press that unfollow button and move on with your day yeah that's a good way to put it i you know the the other thing that i've seen is people drawing comparison between vince williams leaving obviously saddened and Steven Nelson leaving, obviously in a hurry to get out of the market. Well, well, I think and, there's a difference in age too, that Williams is getting, he's over 30, he's getting towards the end of his career. And Nelson right. is in the prime of his career set to probably hit it pretty big on the free agent market, whether it's this year or next year. I mean, even if he just takes a one year deal this year, next year, he can probably cash in pretty big. I mean, he's had two solid seasons, not, you know, I mean, not Pro Bowl seasons, but very solid seasons. Uh, 2019 was pretty outrageous. That was a pretty amazing season. I got to give him props. 2020 wasn't quite as good, but 2019 he was stellar. Yeah, he he was. I would argue that he he a pro. If he'd have made it into the Pro Bowl, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have been surprised. I thought he was I, very good. Yeah, yeah. I I thought that that he was a Pro Bowl caliber, All Pro oh, caliber. Yes. Honestly, corner. In 2019. Now, 2020, I thought his play slipped a little, but he was still very good. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, kind of where I was going with is this. These guys have got a limited window in their lifetimes to make as much money as they can. And I know we don't want it to be about money. You know, we want it to be about winning and losing because we're fans and we love the Steelers and we want to see them win. But these guys in their lives for their lives have got a little bit of time to make as much money as they can to take care of themselves and their family Yes, for the rest of their lives when they're done. And they've got to try and maximize that opportunity. I mean, and that's one of the things Ellie and I were talked about offline, you know, is that Juju Smith Schuster could have made more yep. going someplace else. He got a multi-year offer from Philly, turned it down, had more money to go play with Patrick Mahomes. To go play with Patrick Mahomes, he was offered more money and turned it down and had even more money than that to go play with the Ravens. Had in the that offer turned that down too, but a lot of receivers are turning down the Ravens, it seems. So, yeah, you know. but now, now imagine based on that, imagine anybody else walking away from the Steelers following this. Um, scenario with Juju you're never going to have the same reaction because but Juju did it Juju stayed for for less money so Steven Nelson was probably never going to get quite the reception that maybe he deserved or expected that's a piece of it but by the same token again Nelson didn't make this decision the organization did yeah and that seems to be the point that that's lost on a lot of the fans is they seem to feel like he demanded a trade. Well, he didn't demand a trade. He asked for more money in an extension, and they weren't going to give it to him. So they said, we're going to release you, but we're going to give you an opportunity to go out and seek a trade if you want. Yes. Well, it, that isn't the same thing as the guy demanding a trade. And that, no, seems, to be, that seems to be lost on an awful lot of fans. Yes, yes. He tweeted some things that maybe in the moment he should have thought through and not tweeted. But he did, and, you know, it happens. And you move from on from it. You move on from it. You guys aren't perfect either. Just knock it off. You know, show a little forgiveness, a little empathy. That's all. Stephen Nelson is not Antonio Brown, and I think that's not the best even way to close. Sum it up. Are you kidding me? If AB did even half the shit I heard he did while he was a Steeler, even half, he's got serious issues. Serious mm-hmm. issues. I think okay. Stephen. I always thought Stephen Nelson seemed like a nice person. Yeah, no, I I yeah. tend to agree with you. Uh, and a friend of mine who has interviewed him said he was one of his favorite people to interview as a Steeler, and I think that speaks quite highly of him because it's a really nice group of individuals working in that organization. So it's nice that he's a person that people consider a nice guy. It's just a couple of tweets that were a little bit in poor taste, and you yeah. just have to take it for what it is. Yep. It was certainly, certainly better than I, – I mean, I wouldn't even put Nelson on the level of, like, Nick Vanette, though. I mean, Nick Vanette, like, burned bridges on his way out. Nelson oh, was yeah, just he like – crashed the team. Yeah. yeah, Nelson was just like, I'm angry in the moment. I get it. It's, yes. It happens. Exactly, exactly. Uh, the Steelers also this last week uh, signed offensive lineman Joe Haig 
to a two year deal. Uh, so they signed um, defensive back slash dime backer slash special teams ace Miles Killebrew, and they brought back the vaunted outside linebacker Cassius Marsh, who I knew we were all very concerned that Marsh might not be back, but he is back with the team. Yay, that linebacker depth is taken care of. Sarcasm <laughs> alert. Um, Robert Spillane finally signed his exclusive rights free agent uh, tender. Uh, Chris Wormley was re-signed to a two-year deal. I have mixed emotions on that. Um, we talked about Tyler Simmons, Sutton, Juju, Banner, all of that. Vince Williams, sad day. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, all these things took place there's still a number of holes they need to address on the roster ellie yes most pressing need on the roster right now oh, I hate this <laughs> my mind is completely all over the place well, because... just tell me what you think i think center yes center yeah that's, yeah. I that's agree. a good place to start center or tackle i i think yeah. ian it's absolutely center. I mean, if you remember the Sean Mahan disaster year of oh, 2009. You gotta it's, do it's, that. Why I, do you keep bringing that up? Because it was, we went through, we've gone through such a long streak of good centers Dude, here. that was a nightmare. That, that people forget how bad oh. it is when your center sucks. It's like, like having Ken his, Graham at center. He was, he was on his back more often than he actually blocked a guy. Or he would just be standing there not touching anyone, just looking at the play happen around him when he wasn't on his back. It was it was awful. And not having a center messes up your whole offense because when, when you allow interior pressure, your quarterbacks can't step up into throws. You can't have an interior rushing game, which hurts you on short yardage. You can't bounce anything to the outside because your running back has to make a move in the backfield before he's even getting back to the line of scrimmage just to get there. And forget about getting positive yardage. It's like, you know, you're thankful to get back to the line. It's, yeah, no, center is the most important position that we're missing right now. Okay. But let me ask you this. <laughs> Is there even is there a center in this draft that's worthy of a first round draft pick? Because I don't think there is. The only one I've I've seen potentially would be Creed Humphrey from Oklahoma. Yes, um, uh, but I I think he's here. Here's the thing though: is Oakland cut their like all pro center? They traded him or traded him. Sorry, they were going to cut him and then they traded him. So. If Oakland doesn't take Humphrey in the first, no, they they have they're... they have a guy in place. They gave him an extension, and he is their center of the future. So that's a done deal. They're, okay. they're not taking a center. It's okay. it's I not mean, happening. It's it's one of those games where there's a there's a limited number of of center prospects that you could probably plug in this year and play. Ellie wrote a great profile on Landon Dickerson uh, a couple weeks ago. She talked about him on the podcast. Did a, a fantastic mm-hmm. job breaking down his game. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, he he's probably more of a, a third round pick, I would say. The the kid from Wisconsin Whitewater, probably third round ish. Yep. Um, but I mean, there there's teams that in that second third round bracket also need centers too. We're not the only ones out there that need a center. So um, you know, you got you may have to draft one a little earlier than you're comfortable with, just to make sure you get a good one. Um, so that was why I would say Humphrey would be the only one I would use a first round pick on. I wouldn't use anything higher than a third on Dickerson just because of his injury history. Um, yeah. And the, the Wisconsin Whitewater kid is is probably around a, a late second to mid third round pick. I would say someone may. You're, you're taking that kid. When you take him, you're taking him on potential. You, you don't have a finished product there. He's going to need a lot of work. But yeah, the potential looks pretty damn good. Yeah. Except for the fact that he didn't bench. That bothers me. Uh, but he beat the shit out of people at the senior bowl. So, I mean, he, you can he see what did. he did. He did. He, he, yeah, he's got a little power pack behind him. I don't know if you noticed the size of his ass. I was like, Jesus. Oh my God, he looks like <laughs> Hargrave. Um, he does. He looks like Javon Hargrave. I mean, I, okay, that's an exaggeration. It's not that big. He's not a weeble wobble, but damn. No, I mean, and. You know, some junk in the trunk. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like Craig Wolfley says, that's his power pack right there. That's it. <laughs> OK, Ellie. Some strong feet. I'm down for it. I don't care. Ellie, most yes. pressing defensive need. 
Outside um, linebacker, inside linebacker, corner, or defensive line? That's a good question because I feel like there's a whole there's a bit it's like Swiss cheese out there at the moment. Um there's not a lot of depth. There's no, not that's a lot the of depth. Issue. There's not a lot of depth. I'd say And you and you need a, a nose tackle? Between, yeah, I'd say it's a toss up between linebacker depth or the <sighs> I don't know. I actually I'm pretty don't know. sure I know I, what Ian's going to say, so that's why I asked you first. <laughs> I'd probably say inside linebacker would be one of the things I would think they would be addressing. Pretty, they need to address for depth purposes. Uh, starter dip at inside linebacker would not hurt my feelings. Ian, what do you think? I would say if if you can get a. a top tier prospect at cornerback that would really go a long way and i wrote an article last year that basically said you're better off signing free agent cornerbacks on the market that have been in the league for a few years rather than drafting them because the guys you draft take way too long to develop it's unless you get a guy in the first round that's a Mm -hmm. a plug and play type starter um which those guys are few and far between i mean you're talking your patrick petersons your jalen ramsey's you know guys who are top 10 picks um and we're obviously not picking in the top 10 this year um Mm -hmm. so the guys we'd be looking at even taking later in the first round are probably not plug and play type guys they need already burns yeah no um (laughs) don't get me started there um but i mean i'll say i won't be disappointed if we drafted a corner in the first round i mean maybe the kid from virginia tech falls although he didn't play this past year and kevin colbert said that you know they would definitely weight players that played this past year higher than those that didn't play um i like the kid out of georgia tyson campbell um not eric stokes was the one who ran like the 4.240 um but campbell uh, i was watching tape on georgia's defensive line and outside linebackers and campbell just kept flying up and making plays out of the secondary on like running plays and swing passes and things like that i'm like where's this kid coming from like he's he's flying across the field i mean he looked like the fastest guy on their defense um even though he quote unquote only ran in like the the four fours um which is still pretty darn fast um so i i I like him a lot i think he's a a much more finished product as far as a cover corner than stokes is stokes has speed but he's not really willing to stick his nose in there against the run whereas campbell is a a physical hitter on the outside too um so i wouldn't be disappointed if they took a corner i i kind of agree with ellie that having as we saw with what tampa bay did with levante david and devin white i mean having two rangy inside linebackers really good goes a long way towards being able to mix and match coverages, you know, cover tight ends and running backs. Right. Uh, We saw the, the big drop off in our run defense after Devin Bush went out and Devin Bush is great. But if you could have two guys like that out there at the same time, like, Oh man, would that go? And, And Spillane is not, not that guy. Spillane is good. He's better than I expected him to be. He's definitely good enough to play on first and second down, but I mean, being able to get off the field on third downs would, right having another guy there would would go a long way yeah Um, but at the same time alex highsmith isn't a proven project product either on the outside i mean he played well um and he's he's definitely got room to grow but you know we we definitely need some depth there too and and not just depth that's gonna sit and wait but like guys who can be rotational players on the outside and play you know 10 to 15 snaps a game and not see a significant drop off so they scouted some guys tomlin and colbert went to the florida state pro day florida state has a few guys that um you know are probably later round picks um but could potentially have some athletic upside they were both at penn state today although um you know the the kid from Penn State just put up some insane numbers um, with his Parsons. No, Parsons. Parsons is an inside linebacker, but Parsons put up some. In, yeah, Parsons ran a faster forty than Ryan Chazier did, which is insane. Well, um, it was hand timed though. Yeah, it was hand timed. Let's so with Chazier's though, because all these didn't run all these the four threes that we're seeing are hand timed. Everybody needs to bear that in mind. And and my understanding is that what they are going to do most teams anyway, are they, they add about a half a second to those hand times because they think, well, you know, rather than it being laser timed like it is at the combine, you've got human error involved. Mm-hmm. You've got a lot of guys that are saying, yeah, he ran a 4-3, but they're people. They're not machines. So they add a little bit of time to it. Um, Jason Owe. Machines Owe-way. can make mistakes, Ben. 
Yeah, well, sure. I am Jason... watching Age of Ultron. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Oway is the outside linebacker who was sackless. Yes. This year for Penn State that you're referring to. Is it Oway or Owe or I don't yeah, know. Yeah, Oway, yeah. But yeah, I mean his his three cone drill was like it, almost it wasn't as good quite... as TJ Watts. Yeah. Yeah, almost almost as good, exactly. But that, again, that was hand timed and TJ's was laser timed. Yes. So but nevertheless, I mean he I wouldn't I wouldn't use a first round pick on him and he won't be there in the second for us, but um, you know, the it's there's there's going to be options there for us is what I'm saying that in the the mid to late rounds in the draft and I've said this before I'll say it again you always gamble on athletic upside for outside pass rushers it's you know you're much better off getting a guy who was minimally productive in college like Bud Dupree did not have that many sacks in no. college he, um, he he was not productive at all I mean I don't want to say at all but he was not very productive at Kentucky by comparison to what he's done in the NFL yes. That is correct. So, but but nevertheless, your your history is proven. You're much better off gambling on athletic upside and minimal college production versus a lot of college production like Jarvis Jones had and not much athletic upside like Jarvis uh, Jones. Terrible. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, that was bad. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, I gave a really roundabout answer. But if I had to pick one spot, I'd pick cornerback. To if I had to pick I one spot to, to address in free agency, I'd pick cornerback because I think you can draft the other ones and get contributions this year from guys. Well, who that, and I think there are a handful of nickel corners that are still on the market that could fill that spot for a year, while our two backup outside corners develop. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not convinced at this point that lane will develop i want to see what um uh pierre god what is his name <laughs> james pierre yeah james pierre can do yes yeah, excuse me um i want to know what he, what he can do i you know we saw glimpses last year but i i just when you see a guy like that that is that raw when they get enough tape on him they're going to make him look bad and fans are going to attack him. And the press is going to ask him a lot of questions and turn up the heat on him. And he's going to get into his own head, which is not where you want to, where you want to be as a corner. You still want to be there. Mm-mm. So I have a feeling that he, he might struggle if he had to be in a regular role at this stage of the game. Um, yeah. There are a lot of people who are going, no, no. Yeah. But this, what, what would happen is he would get in He'd face a lot of criticism from a lot of fans, and there'd be a lot of other fans, again, the whole binary thing we talk about, who were going, just just give him a chance. Just give him a chance. Well, that's, you know, the guy can either produce or he can't. And the just give him a chance mantra doesn't will him into being a better player. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. He, he's got to get out of his own head. And, and again, I don't want to put that guy in that position. So what I'd like to see happen is – for them to sign a nickel, I hope, uh, just a guy who can hold it down for a year or two and let those two guys in the outside develop while they bring in another nickel behind the nickel and develop him. Um, if I had my brothers in free agency, I don't know what's going to happen now, but the Steelers have plenty of space, obviously, after terminating the contracts of Vince Williams and Steven Nelson. They're in pretty damn good shape and then you know on top of that creating even more with the restructure slash renegotiation slash probably voidable years they added to eric ebron's deal yeah um ian you alluded to this before tom and colbert have been on the pro day tour kind of recap for us where they've been the last few days yeah uh so they were at penn state today um and one of the really interesting things this year is since teams are only allowed to bring three uh, scouting members to a pro day, you know, when the two of them go together, you know, who's the the third person that they bring with them, right? Because they can only bring three. Um, so today they had um, uh, Roberts, Alfonso Roberts, I think Alfonso Roberts. Yeah. Uh, tight end. Alfonso Roberts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it, 
I just had Roberts in my notes. So at any rate, <laughs> right uh, Mr. Roberts uh, was there with them at, at Penn State. He is their tight ends coach, um, working out Pat Freermuth, who is, I mean, you watch this kid play and he just looks like a Steelers tight end. I mean, he can he can do anything you want him to do. He can block, he can go over the middle, he can catch. He's, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say he's Heath Miller because Heath Miller is but he reminds me of him. <laughs> He does. in his dealer's history but i mean if, no eric if, green uh, either he way wasn't i mean such this, an asshole he would be a fantastic stealer <laughs> looks like a Steelers tight end um so so yeah but like we talked about penn state had some other guys put up some pretty insane numbers today um a couple days ago they were at alabama with matt canada um obviously matt canada now the offensive coordinator so scouting some of the offensive prospects there although a lot of alabama's offensive prospects didn't actually participate in drills so um you know some of them like Najee harris i mean all right you know we've talked about Najee harris a lot and you know i, I i've gone on the record on this show saying i would be thrilled if Najee harris was a stealer i just feel like we have bigger needs in the first round to address and you can get a quality running back in the second round but that said if we wind up picking Najee harris I'll be thrilled that he's a stealer. Um, but to speak to the kid's character, I mean, he drove nine and a half hours from his home in Alabama or his home in uh, Dallas. Dallas. Yeah, Dallas um, to Alabama because his flight got canceled or delayed just so he could be there as pro day to support his teammates because he wasn't even going to work out. But he got in the car and drove overnight to get there, which is, I mean, awesome for the kid's character. Um, yeah. they, were, they were at Florida State with Carl Dunbar, the defensive coordinator, or defensive line coach. Um they were at Auburn with Ike Hilliard, uh, the wide receivers coach. They were at Georgia with Grady Brown, who's the assistant defensive backs coach. And they were at Clemson with Matt Canada, also offensive coordinator. Um, we're not getting Trevor Lawrence. Sorry. Um, but, come on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Travis Straight up. is a name that has, has come up. So that's kind of a summary of where they've been so far. Um, I'll say, you know, looking forward in the future, uh, tomorrow, Friday, uh, although probably today when most people are listening to this, is going to be an interesting day because both Michigan and Virginia Tech have their pro days. So it'll be interesting to see which one of those two the Steelers hit heavier. Um, they have hit them both heavy in the past, um, obviously, with selections of Devin Bush and Terrell Edmonds. So um, it'll be interesting to see which one of those two they decide to go to. Uh, next week, I expect them to go to North Carolina. Um, Obviously, they've got two really good running backs and a handful of other good players, and you know we'll see where our, wherever else they land. But that's kind of and, and Notre Dame on the thirty first of March as well. I'm expecting the uh, Tomlin Colbert Pro Day tour to hit up the Fighting Irish as well. And look at who uh, they've got a pretty good inside linebacker slash safety um, and a couple other guys too. Huh. Well, speaking yeah. of the University of Notre Dame. A wide receiver from that school is currently a Pittsburgh Steeler and was involved in a horrible bar fight the other night. (laughs) Oh, Liam Eikenberg, too, the offensive lineman. Sorry, go ahead. Continue. About about two weeks ago. It's tragic. Uh, No one was actually injured or left there in an ambulance or anything. But still, still, it was terrible. It was awful. Caught on video. Clearly, this player is a bad seed and should be cut tomorrow. Uh, Ellie. Yes. What do you think of this Chase Claypool nonsense? Um, I think you pretty much answered it by calling it nonsense. <laughs> um, oh God, can I? If I'm going to be a hundred percent honest, mm-hmm. that's okay. the idea. Be a hundred percent honest. <laughs> if I'm going to be one hundred percent honest, I don't care. I don't right? care. Right? Right? Yeah. What's the, like, what is the big deal? I don't get it. Yeah, like, so he got into a... It's not a fight. Let's start using that word. It was a scuffle. It was a little scuffle between other people, and he was there and involved. Now, I will say, if... And it appears that he did kick someone who was on the ground. Um, A bitch move. The guy... A bitch move. Whatever. The guy's falling at his knee, hits him in the shin, he backs up, kicks him in the... Reflexively kicks him in the head. Yeah. I got to be honest with you. Most people in that situation don't walk away. They try to defend themselves because they're in a situation where they're pulling people off. And if you're an NFL wide receiver and someone jumps at your knees suddenly when you're not, Mm -hmm. you're not expecting it, you're going to react a certain kind of way. 
What do I think he should have done? I think he should have just walked away and not gotten involved at all. I think he should have let the guys fight. Just be like, whatever, have fun, have at it. I don't care. That would have uh, been he, ideal, yes. But, but he, he didn't. didn't. He's a kid. You live, you learn. This is another thing where Steelers fans are completely overreacting. Um, this is a giant nothing burger. It's not even a blip on the radar as far as I'm concerned. I don't get it. Is there yeah, something here that I'm that I'm missing? Yes, it's that he makes TikTok videos. So obviously he's a terrible human and we need okay. to hammer him as much as we can. Exactly. Setting aside the TikTok, <laughs> this video that we saw on TMZ, is there something more about this that I am missing? Is there something that's driving the outrage? I what, what I think the... what is driving the outrage in, in truth is unfortunately he's being grouped into a situation and it all goes back to Juju. Um, the whole thing with Juju happened uh, and, and and people turned on Juju because of the dancing on the logos, the TikTok thing, whatever, not interested. Then you have Chase Claypool, <laughs> who's clearly his friend. Um, he then gets into a situation, that's what we'll call it, because I don't... Uh, the word fight, if that's a fight, I'm a WWE wrestler, you know what I mean? That was a fight. <laughs> So then he gets into this bar altercation and all of a sudden people are looking at the Steelers organization saying, look what your team's capable of. They're bad seeds. You're not hammering down the law. That's what they're all thinking. They think that yeah. Mike Tomlin is, walks in. And it's he's like, Tomlin's fault. He should keep yeah. tabs on all those players in the off season. That's, That's right. What he thinks like he re- they all <laughs> think that like he just high fives them when they come in. Good job on that bar fight chase. Like as if that's what they're actually doing on a daily basis. <laughs> I can't. Yes. People have got too much time on their hands. Yeah, because our obviously, you know, the the coaches that weren't quote unquote players coaches that you know actually ran a tight ship. Definitely, like you know, Bill Cowher and Chuck Knoll definitely didn't have guys getting arrested with a kilo of pot in their trunk, Bam Morris, yeah. or shooting guns at police helicopters, Ernie Holmes. Um, so <laughs> you know, um, those guys ran such a tight ship that exactly. none of their players ever acted badly. It was it Joe Green? Of- Joe it's Green, not. mean Joe Green. Yeah. Greatest stealer of all time. Threw a football into the stands. Once broke his own helmet on a on a goalpost. He was so fucking angry about losing. Um, once quit on the team. Cursed out fans in visiting stadiums on numerous occasions. But the quitting on the team thing. Joe once packed up his gear and was walking to his car and was going to quit and had to be brought back inside and talked into staying. Mm -hmm. Joe Green, greatest stealer of all time. (laughs) I see your point. Okay. Enough said. Enough said. These guys are not character risks. This is not a big deal. This is a giant nothing burger. We have nothing better to talk about. So we're, we're talking about this and we're making a big thing out of it. And I just, I don't get it. I, you know, I just, I think it's so, it's just such a non issue. I think the thing about him kicking someone, yeah, he shouldn't have done that. That was a silly thing to do. eh, And, you know, I would, I I have no sympathy for that guy. Fuck him. I don't have sympathy for him either, but you shouldn't. He, he shouldn't have. He should have just not done it. But in the moment, there are lots of things I shouldn't have done in the moment. But you do them, and and for, luckily for me, no one captures mine on TMZ and posts it for the world to see. Yeah, Unfortunately, he's thing. not. Yeah, for real, for me too. But he's not. Um, he's not afforded that luxury, which just comes of part of the role of being a Pittsburgh Steeler. I'm really grateful that there weren't cell phones and cameras when I was in my twenties, because if there were people would still be talking about the dumb shit that I did. (laughs) I would have loved for there to, you know, I'd people, people really should have, should sit back and wonder what it would be like if you were to go into the 70s Steelers locker room and see what those kinds of guys were doing um, on a Friday night or um, behind closed doors. The things that I'm sure if, if if social media was rife when Heinz Ward was around, he would be just like Juju and Chase. He'd be having fun. He'd be making TikToks. He gives me that impression. Would everybody hate him? Because he's like a fan favorite. 
Uh, That's a great question, Ellie. Maybe he might be. I mean, you know, uh, he did Dancing with the Stars in the off season. He did a number of other things. Um, yeah, and, and, and a number of other things like he was arrested for DUI. Yeah, and he and, and, held and, out and, from and, Cam. And, and, yeah, and and he Hines called was... um, he called Big Ben a coward for not playing through a concussion. <laughs> yeah, and and I mean, let. Hines was a legendary partier in the Pittsburgh scene. Let's just yep. be perfectly frank, okay? He was. The guy played hard. He also worked his ass off, and we loved him for it. Juju plays hard and works his ass off, plays his ass off, and we criticize him because he plays hard when he's not actually working. So it's like, I, I just I don't understand the distinction there. I don't get it. But Me I think either. eventually, eventually, this will all level out and people will understand him. It's just taking some time. You know, it's a generational thing. Um, I, I think that he really is. Juju is really about a bra- embracing the moment and the right now of all of this. And that is his thing. And he's not really all that concerned about when people don't like him. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he does random ass shit like having giant parties in the park for the people in the city and a water balloon fight. I mean, who does that? Who who does that? Mm-hmm. Honestly. I will Is say that though, something I, you or I would do. I, I wouldn't do that. I mean, but, you know, he just likes to have fun. He's just that guy. So if I had if I had millions of dollars when I was 22 or 23 or 24 years old, I might have done stuff like that, too, you know? Um, and, and that being said, you know, I mean, Juju's story is pretty well known, but, I mean, the kid grew up sleeping on the floor of his garage in his house. Like, yeah. he, he deserves to be able to have fun and live I his life. I, I, agree I, I agree. I agree with all of that. I see no uh, issue with any of it. And I also don't see the issue of the Chase Claypool thing. Obviously, I do nah, think it was a little bit of a it's, non-issue. It's nothing. I'm sorry. It is nothing. I, I will not give any credence whatsoever to people's gripes about it. It's just, it's so nothing. You know, I, I don't get it. I don't understand what the outrage is. I don't understand the people that are feeding the outrage because they like the clicks. I don't get any of it. It's like, are we really that desperate to have something to talk about? I saw an article today about um, should the Steelers consider trading him or cutting yeah, him? Yeah, that was pretty dumb. And the person who wrote that is actually really smart. And that is extremely disappointing because I know that guy. And I mean, I don't know him personally, but I, I know some things he's done before. He was involved with that blog. And he's wicked smart and really knows football. And that article was a giant piece of shit. (laughs) And it it was. And I still can't believe he wrote it. It's just, you know, somebody, Zach, quoted, tweeted it out today. He's like, this guy keeps surprising me in a bad way. (laughs) I'm just like... Oh, yeah, I wasn't going to write that, but yeah, you're right. It, it's disappointing. I anyway, just mentioned the Billy Madison quote, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, you should have tweeted it. <clears throat> but I, I, I did. Did you? Oh, I, 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 it, was, it, was, it was more of a subtweet. I, I basically said, you know, <laughs> this is my feeling on anyone suggesting we trade Chase Claypool, and it was, you know, that we are all now dumber for having listened to you speak. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, but, one accurate <laughs> description yeah but it's it's even more disappointing when you know that guy is capable of so much more he's so good he really has a good football mind and to write some fucking drivel like that (laughs) my god we made it an hour tonight before ben swore how about that no it's a record oh i swore while you had you were putting maggie to bed Um, oh okay i'm just used to it so i actually missed it (laughs) <laughs> uh, so uh, before we get going for the evening uh yes. miss ellie any parting <laughs> thoughts on on the steelers this week my parting thought is actually i think what we've learned this week is you know don't take everything at face value whether it's players 
saying something spicy on the way out or another player at a bar kicking around on the in the head for <laughs> beating up on his friend at the end of the day they're in the grand scheme of things if it's not directly affecting the production of my team i simply don't care yeah that's my passing word uh, okay <laughs> ian um i'll uh i'll fall back on something i've said quite often is that it, no news in the off season other than signing someone to a contract is good news. Uh, basically anything that can happen to your team in the off season is bad. It's any news about your team is usually someone got into an altercation or someone got arrested or mm-hmm. someone got injured playing basketball, which like you wouldn't think playing basketball is all that bad because these guys are professional athletes, but like more guys get suffer like serious injuries. Like, Terrell Suggs tours ACL or not ACL tours Achilles playing basketball one year. Like don't play basketball in the off season guys. Um, you know, TJ Watt today tweeted that golf is hard. Golf is a great off season game. I fully endorse all Steelers players playing golf as much as they want to <laughs> and not playing basketball <laughs> because basketball injuries, you can seriously mess yourself up for a long time. Golf injuries, not quite as bad. Um, so yes, golf is hard. I agree, TJ. Um, but yeah, so no, nothing, nothing good happens in the off season. There's that. There is that. I, <laughs> on that note, yeah, I, nice boring off seasons are fantastic. And I, I think we've kind of at, certain points gotten conditioned to the fact that it's the off season and there's going to be controversy. And so we're ready to react to to any news with dismay and disgust. And what's resulted is our reactions have become hyperbole and ridiculous. I mean, this, this thing with Steven Nelson, you know, has gotten a little overblown. The thing with Chase Claypool is, is ridiculous. That that is just I'm sorry. It's just so dumb, mm-hmm. uh, you know. And then Juju, you know, he's been a controversial character for 12 months. It is what it is. Um, no, they people... wanted him to be a controversial character. <sighs> he's not doing anything particularly controversial. I don't I, think. I and... tend to agree with you. The controversy is the conversation around him, peripheral exactly, to yes. him. I agree with and... you. There. And it it, it kind of is what it is. I, I don't think he's done anything to deserve it. I just think it's a phenomenon that's going to continue to grow until it dies. And at some point it will. How um, does so, it die? How does something like that come to an end? I don't know. I'm kind of desensitized to it now. You know, I mean, basically Juju pretty much, I think he trolls one member of the Pittsburgh Steelers media mm-hmm. purposely. Um And that's fine, whatever. But, you know, the rest of them, he just pretty much ignores them. And so that's basically what you got to do is just pretty much ignore it. Just be like, whatever, man, I'm just going to do my thing. And if it bothers you, it does. Sorry. If you like it, cool. Uh, Moving on. I got a job to do while I'm here. Yeah. um, Yeah. You know, he, he says he plays better when he's having fun. I tend to agree with him when he's having fun, when he's enjoying himself, he tends to play better on the field. Um, The 2019 and the 2020 seasons, 2018, 2019, 2020, that pretty much spelled that out. I mean, that guy, when he's having a good time out, he plays better on the field. He produces better. Mm -hmm. So if that's the frame of mind he needs to be into, then that's where he needs to get. Um, But I digress. Uh, I, I don't really have any any parting shots this evening other than, you know, I, I think the Steelers have a number of holes they still need to fill via free agency before the draft. Um, there was a rumor this week that they were looking to re-sign Al Villanueva. Nothing has come of that. Um, I'll just go on record right now saying that I think it's a terrible idea. I hope they don't do it, but who knows? You know, they run the team. I don't. Maybe they'll bring him back. Um, By the way, we should mention, since Mark is not here, that Michigan does, in fact, suck. 
Yeah, they do. They do. Yeah. And and Mark will like hearing that we brought that in. Um, we we do have a bunch of holes we need to to get filled, and that Steelers typically do sign enough in free agency to take care of the majority of their needs so that when they go into the draft, they have some flexibility. But right now, I mean, it's anyone's guess who they might take in the first round because there are that many needs. There really are. I mm-hmm. I, I hope they don't think they're going to start B.J. Finney at center. Um, anyway, I digress. I, I should again thank our sponsor, Deck Roofing of South Florida. Again, for uh, all of your commercial, what? <laughs> <laughs> commercial what? residential your multifamily. Com- no, 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 no. Commercial, Marksa. commercial <laughs> multifamily and mixed use needs, roofing needs. Please contact the good folks at Deck Roofing. Sorry, brain fart. They don't do residential. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> for Ellie and Ian, I bid you good night. And hey, Ravens suck. Go Steelers. <laughs>